Good morning, everyone. Woo! Right. How is everyone? Do you like, you like, yes, too blessed to be stressed? Do you like the deep, booming sound of my voice? Nobody does. Oh, thank you, thank you. I, I was, this is kind of like falling off a, or, or getting on your bicycle again. After uh, Ann and I had a wonderful week of vacation, uh, not last week, but the week before, and of course, I want to thank once again Tim Thompson, who preached the sermon on that day and con sorry, conducted worship services. I shouldn't do announcements with a cough drop in my mouth, should I? Anyway, we're glad to be back. It's wonderful uh, to, to be with you again today. And so let's get started by welcoming our new choir accompanist, Miss M. Sun Lee. Now, Repeat after me. M. M. Sun. Sun. Okay, M. Sun. Okay. But you can call her Miss Lee if you like. Okay. Anyway, welcome. We're so pleased to have you with us. Okay, and of course, uh, it is time, as always, to think about birthdays and anniversaries. I know that uh, Joe Sappington is watching online. We want to wish him a happy birthday. Sir? Joe Sappington? Raise your hand. Am I? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not Joe Sappington. Okay. Okay, it's fine. For those people who are watching online, we have multiple Joes, right? And so, uh, yeah, there was a little confusion. Joe Sappington, who's watching online. But Joe Williams is here. Okay, very good. And Tom's birthday. Yeah, of course. Uh, my birthday. And, of course, as uh, in the words of Sammy Hagar, I can't drive. 55. There we go. Any other birthdays that I'm not aware of? Uh, Jesus is coming in a couple weeks. Jesus has got a birthday coming up. Shania? Okay, well, okay, we'll go ahead and, and note, it, note that. But on the 19th, the week of the 19th, we will sing happy birthday to you and Sebastian. Yes, I do. On Friday. I won't be a day over 100. Or 55. I'll be 50. I don't mind telling you that. Okay. Any birthdays, anniversaries? Okay. Then, uh, without any further ado, shall we? much. I very much appreciate it. Joe, I hope that you had a great, uh, Joe Sappington. Joe uh, Williams, I'm sure you'll have a birthday sooner or later. Okay, now on to the announcements. Uh, the same as usual, uh, continue to bring in those goods for um, uh, networks, mostly non-perishable food items. Canned protein is really good. Last week, uh, there was a tremendous load of bread from the Publix uh, dry, uh, pickup. So we loaded all that into the back of Ann's car, and she took all that over there as well. So they did have this well, but please continue. Math tutoring continues. There tends to be, there continues to be a stream of people coming in for tutoring. So that's awesome, and thank you to Kirk for his volunteer time in doing that. Moving on, uh, did I get the, I moved my slides around, let's see. Uh, ordering the, sorry, I know you're thinking, what's he talking about? Why is he muttering? The answer is because I wrote it down differently on my list here. You see these beautiful poinsettias throughout the building? They're real ones. Those, of course, you can buy for $10, which is great. Last year, I think they were 16 so we have a, a better deal on that. There is a form, as you see, pictured here. I think they're on the table back there, if I'm not mistaken. And, and there's some out in the Narthex, perhaps. Narthex? Okay, you just fill it out. If you want to uh, purchase one in memory of or in honor of someone, obviously just put all that in there, the number and so forth, a suggested donation of $10 for that. Next slide, please. That's the one I was expecting earlier. Uh, I would say thank you for a successful angel tree project. 
Am I right, Diane? All those have been brought in. Right. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for bringing the Angel Tree uh, gifts. And now that is over. We have a few days. Is it actually, it's short notice, but as you know, Networks has what's called the Good Neighbor Shop. And they basically open it up to people who are underserved, allow them to purchase gifts for uh, their families at a re much, much reduced price so that they have the dignity of having paid for the gifts, but not having to pay the high prices at the, at the store. So uh, unfortunately, we've got to get those turned in before this week is over. But if you have any toys that you can bring in for the get Good Neighbor Shop, if you can deliver them by December the 6th, we will have them. Once again, Reverend Ann will take them over to uh, Networks for you. Uh, moving on, we also have the blanket drive. I see that many people have brought blankets in, and we're very much appreciative of that. You can continue to do that. And in fact, even after we have them delivered, if you say, oh, here's a blanket, and you bring it in, it's fine. Because they'll always need them, and we can always get them over to our friends at the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, just a continuous reminder that on Wednesday night, we, ha and we have our usual activities. 6 p.m. is the bell choir practice in the sanctuary and Bible study in the fisherman classroom. We continue to read Mere Christianity and have very uh, stimulating conversations. I think we've had a pretty much a full house uh, every time, and the good news is there's always room for more. And if you thought about coming and you just not made it, don't, don't let that keep you from coming. We've got room, and we'll catch you up to where we are. So please consider doing that. And as you will see, I have corrected the time because we paid attention to the broadcast last week, and, and I know that I had the wrong time listed on the slide there, right? So choir practice is at 7 p.m. There you go. Next slide, please. Our December calendar uh, is really focused around the big musical productions. So, uh, what, my goodness, a week from this Saturday will be the Tucker Community Singers Christmas Concert. It's going to be awesome. And it's going to be so awesome that I strongly urge you to get here early to claim a seat. Because typically we have 200 to 250 people who show up for these we bring every possible chair we can find in the building into this room, and we still find people sitting in the, up in the choir loft and sometimes on the floor, or around the wall, standing up, or out in the narthex. So if you want a seat, please come early. You'll also be glad to know that we'll have security on hand for that. And if that's not enough music for you, the next day, Sunday, December the 17th, the choir will present a musical service in worship, of course. And that will also be really wonderful, and we will enjoy it greatly. Uh, the last thing to mention, we will have services on Christmas Eve. That's a Sunday. I don't know why any church would ever consider closing. I know that sounds a little like I'm being critical of other churches, but there are churches that do not have services on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. And I'm like, why? Starbucks is open, you know? And then, of course, on New Year's, day, New Year's Eve, excuse me, is a Sunday, that will be the day when we bring out the hymnals and sing everyone's request. What is the hymn that you would love to hear and to sing? We'll please be sure and come if you are uh, ready for that. The last slide, I believe, is once again the thank you. I imagine it was Joe Williams who made the pick up today, and the reason I know this is because when building around 9 a.m. or so, they, they were already there. That's a sign that it was Joe. That's how we know. Okay. Now, with all the announcements behind us, let us prepare for worship. But today, being the first Sunday of Advent, we begin with the hanging of the green.
Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church of Atlanta. We're glad that you're here today. I see um, some new faces. We welcome you. If this is your first time visiting, we have a gift for you before you leave. Um, if you're online, welcome as well. And uh, please stand as you are able for hymn number 119, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, verses 1, 2, and 4. On the first Sunday of Advent, we look for the signs of hope in our world. People helping each other, walls of separation being broken down, bridges crossing wide divides. We find, so hopes, we find signs of hope in the family traveling a long way from home, expecting a baby and being surrounded by the compassion of strangers. We light this first candle in the hope we find in the world as we wait for Christ to come into our world. Come surely, Lord Jesus, as dawn follows night. Our hearts long to greet you as roses, the light. Salvation draw near us, our vision engage. One candle is lit for the hope of the age.
Amen. One thing I really appreciate about Advent is that it is more than Christmas. It is more than just celebrating and waiting for and expecting the coming of the Lord Jesus. It is actually a focus on the reason that he came. And that reason that he came is uh, embodied in the various readings of the Advent candle, starting with today, which is alternately referred to as the prophecy candle or the hope candle. And as in the weeks to come, we'll read more and more about that. But you'll notice in today's service, if you're really attuned to what's going on between the reading and the hymns and the uh, prayer and, and the sermon, of course, that there is a specific theme to that hope. And I'll just invite you to consider what that is. In the meantime, we all have hopes. And as we come together, not only as individuals, but also as members of the congregation, let us bring that hope before the throne of Almighty God. Let us pray. Creator of the world, you are the potter, we are the clay, and you form us in your image. Remind us yet again that we are the work of your hand, not the other way around. When we have insisted you act according to our rules, when we have closed our ears to your call and warped your design, forgive us. Press and mold us anew that we may better reflect your image Give us courage to work not for ourselves, but for the coming of your kingdom that makes all things new. Shape our spirits by Christ's transforming power, that as one people we may live out your compassion and justice, whole and sound in the realm of your peace. God of justice and peace, from the heavens you rain down mercy and kindness that all on earth may stand in awe and wonder before your marvelous deeds. Raise our heads in expectation that we may yearn for the coming day of the Lord and stand without blame before your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. And now in this time of gathered worship, we appeal to you as many parts of the one body of Christ. Hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts. And now hear us as we join our hearts, minds, and voices in the prayer Jesus teaches us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time in our service for the offering. This is a chance for us to give back and bless others with not only our time and talent, but also monetarily. Will the deacons please come forward?
us pray. For the blessings of this and all our days, we thank you, gracious God. Accept, we pray, not just this money, but also our lives freely offered in gratitude. Use them both in this place and wherever you might take us. Amen. You may be seated. That was, of course, a beautiful offertory, and I'm glad that you did that one this week, David, and last week you did the more upbeat one, because if you had done it last week, and I was, I mean, that one this week, and I was here, I might be out here dancing a jig or something, and I don't want to embarrass myself in front of everybody, but we did enjoy listening to it online. Isn't that what worship is about? It's about celebration. It's about uh, reaching beyond ourselves to each other and upward to God. Music is a tool for that. But so is the time that we are now going to observe, the Lord's Supper, that is, that through these elements of a morsel of bread, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes they seem more like styrofoam than bread, but it is what this represents, and a tiny little cup of grape juice. We relate to God. We relate to the transcendent reality that God is. We relate to each other. And it's a wonderful thing. And another thing I want to emphasize about it is that in the Disciples of Christ tradition, which is what our congregation is, we don't have some kind of exclusionary practice with the Lord's Supper. It is inclusive. Anyone and everyone who desires to partake of the Lord's Supper is welcome to do so, which means that if you are worshiping with us for the first time, we want you to know that you are welcome at this table. The gospel reading for today, the first Sunday of Advent, tells us about recognizing the signs of Jesus' coming. But for this time of meditation on the Lord's Supper, Let's turn our attention to the signs of his already having been here. We stand before this table, the communion table, which Jesus gave to us to remember him by. We stand before the bread and the cup, reminders of God's love which has no bound. And we stand before this table as believers in Jesus, who in some small way, Every one of us, each one of us, right, each one of us can be a sign that Jesus has come and that God is present in the world. And now for the words of institution. For the tradition I received from the Lord and also handed on to you, is that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, with the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial of me. Whenever you eat this bread, then, and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Eternal God, we ask you, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who receive it, that we may Dear Heavenly Father, Each time we take communion, we come before you recommitting our hearts, our thoughts, and our everything to you. Please forgive us of our many sins, dear Lord. Fill us today with your powerful spirit and your most loving grace. Amen.
scripture this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to the advers adversaries, sorry, adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you and your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of God for the people of God.
lovely. And I was watching. You, you guys followed direction very well. Very nice. Thank you. Also, thanks to Mandy for reading that uh, rather lengthy passage of Scripture. I warned her early in the week. She says, I can handle it. And she did. And, of course, she's had a busy week among all of her other responsibilities, getting the sanctuary ready for today's uh, first Sunday of Advent, which uh, I'm sure was a little bit stressful, but uh, you survived. And here we are, first Sunday of Advent, the sanctuary is decorated and the candle has been lit, the first one that is, and, and the scriptures have been read, so all is good. This is wonderful. You may know, I'm sure many of you are used to the fact that there is a lectionary and the scriptures have been divided up into a three-year cycle of reading in which if you, if you go through the lectionary and you read all the passages, you will have read the entire Bible pretty much in three years' time. Well, typically, I don't follow the lectionary most of the year in my preaching. That is because as a minister, I feel it's very important to speak to the needs of the congregation, speak to the needs of the world as they exist in that moment. Now, that can be done from the lectionary, but sometimes it's difficult, you know, to stretch something that Zechariah said, you know, 3,000 years ago and apply it to what's happening in the world today. But this year for Advent, I always read the lectionary during Advent because it's, it's focused on the birth of Christ. But this year I decided to read only the Old Testament readings for the first three Sundays of Advent. That means they all come from the prophet Isaiah. And so unofficially, I'm referring to these sermons as the gospel according to Isaiah. The reason I'm not referring to them officially as the gospel according to Isaiah is because if you type that into Google, you're going to find that there's about 10 million other people who have used that title. So, you know, it's, it's not mine originally. But anyway, unofficially, I'm calling these the gospel according to Isaiah. And I thought this year we would read for the first three Sundays of Advent the words of Isaiah and think about the following three questions in the process. The first question is, how did Isaiah and his audience hear these words? So go back to the words that, that uh, Mandy read for us earlier. How did Isaiah hear them? How did his audience hear them? Number two, what did the writers of the New Testament uh, see in these words of Isaiah, and how did they relate them to Jesus? Because when the gospel writers were telling about Jesus, they went back to the Old Testament for scriptural underpinning, and they found an awful lot of underpinning in the words of Isaiah. And thirdly, why do we read them today? What value do they have to us in the 21st century, when we are separated from Isaiah by about 2,600 years, separated from the New Testament by about 2,000 years, why do we still read these words? And of course, the first Sunday of Advent is the one where we light the prophecy candle, which is focused on the hope that God will act on behalf of God's people a hope that is found in the prophet Isaiah, among others. Thus, the readings focus on the, this expectation and preparation for God's actions on behalf of God's people. So we're going to read through today's passage section by section, and I want to ask you to notice a, a couple of things. One, does it sound like a prayer? Because as I read through that passage, you know what I was thinking? That's a pastoral prayer. That is a prophet or a priest or a minister standing in front of a congregation of people and speaking to God on behalf of those people. And so as we treat it section by section, we're going to look at it as a prayer. And I think the three sections might be identified in the following way. First, a remembrance of God's visitation at Mount Sinai. Okay, just hoping you guys will remember about Mount Sinai. Okay, the second section, repentance for sins. And finally, a request for God to remember them and to act on their behalf. 
In fact, remembering is acting in the, in the Bible. And to make it easy, just, just get those remembrance, repentance, and a request to be remembered. So treating this passage as a prayer, let's look again at the first part, which is verses 1 through 5a, and that's fancy talk for verses 1 through the first half of verse 5, right? We divided verse 5 up in two parts. And I have referred to this as Israel's remembrance of God's visitation at Mount Sinai. And so as I reread through these verses and you listen again, see if you can find clues in the passage that the congregation is being reminded of the people of Israel standing at the foot of Mount Sinai where God has appeared to Moses. Okay, here we go. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known among to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. Did you hear any references to Mount Sinai? Good. I mean, at least you could have imagined Charlton Heston in there somewhere, right? Okay. In all seriousness, the appearance of God at Sinai, as told in Exodus chapters 19 and 20, was a lot of the, had a lot of the things that we saw here. Imagine, for instance, that you were one of those Hebrew slaves that had been released from bondage in Egypt. You had been taken out and you had run from the Egyptian army. You had crossed the Red Sea. Uh, you had, you know, eaten the manna and drank the water from the rock and so forth. You had seen all these miraculous things from God. But also remember that those liberated Hebrew slaves in Exodus, up until that point, had only heard about God. I mean, they had heard also about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they had heard that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had had these experiences with God. But you might understand if they were skeptical, right? You might understand that they were having trouble believing them as anything more than just stories that were told because here they were in bondage for 400 years, right? In fact, you were born a child of slavery, the child of a slave who was the child of a slave, on and on and on for many, many generations. And maybe in the midst of that servitude, you might have asked this question, where is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? But now God has re-entered history. God has intervened into your world. And here you are at the foot of the mountain. And it scares you to death because of this great terrifying display of thunder and lightning and smoke. Let's look at the words of Exodus 20, verses 18 and 20 through 21. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Have you ever thought about that, the encounter with God being that frightful? Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near the, to the thick darkness where God was. But remember, we're studying a passage from Isaiah. And Isaiah was many, many centuries removed from that great epiphany. Isaiah's generation had seen the destruction of Judah. They had seen the destruction of God's temple in Judah. And they knew 
that a few generations before them, the northern kingdom of Israel had been annihilated by the Assyrians. Now just think about it. Israel had been divided north and south after the death of King Solomon. The Assyrians were an empire in northern Iraq, what is today Iraq. The Babylonians, southern Iraq, what is today Iraq. Each of them had a turn at being sort of the world empire. The, the northern kingdom of Israel was wiped off the face of the earth by the Assyrians. And now the Babylonians, about 200 or so years later, were threatening to do the same with the Jewish people from Judah. The question on their minds was probably a lot like the one on the mind of Israelis today in the 21st century. Where is God? Hamas is small potatoes compared to the Babylonians, right? But the sense of violation is the same. I must also add that a former teacher of mine, a rabbi, was in Israel on October the 7th in synagogue when the attack commenced on October the 7th. I've been reading his account of how he got through that day, of how he and his family got through the days to come, and the continuing commentary on what's going on in Israel right now. And as I read through those passages, and as I read through this text of Isaiah, <laughs> prepare for Advent, it makes me realize that the scriptures we read for inspiration are the product of the interaction of the Jewish people with God in their times of distress. Think about it. Their times of distress, their crying out to God, and we're reading those passages today. We are the beneficiaries of this. And though we might mention, somebody will have mentioned that the Israeli government is secular. They're not really, that's true. But within the, the state of Israel, there are Jews and Christians and even Muslims who are crying out to God right now. Where are you? during this crisis. So this kind of answers our first question. How did Isaiah and his audience understand these words? They were crying out to God, right? And as to the second question, what did the writers of the New Testament see in them and how did they relate to Jesus? Well, how do they relate to Jesus? From the Christian perspective, Advent is about God breaking into history with Jesus in Israel at a specific point in history. We call him the Prince of Peace, but remember, we also call him the, the King of the, that's true too, but before that, there's another one, King of the Jews, right? And I want you to think about what that means. Advent is a time for us like the Israelites of the past and the Jewish people of today, to look expectantly to God for an intervention in a world that is filled with trouble. I think it's fair to say that our world is filled with trouble. Since we live in relative comfort here in the United States, perhaps it doesn't seem like there's this sense of urgency we can see that there's a war in Ukraine. We can see that there's a war in Israel, but we can also change the channel, right? When the United States was attacked on 9-11, we all remember what that was like. We all remember where we were, what we were doing at that moment. The world rallied behind the United States as we decided to go after those terrorists. When ISIS came into being, and they threatened the world. No one really criticized the United States and other nations for going in there and doing what? Let's be honest, what did they do? Annihilated them. And where did they hide? They hid in hospitals. They hid in communities. 
they hid behind human shields. But today, currently, <laughs> an aggressive terrorist organization that constantly fires rockets into Israel invaded, raped, murdered, killed, kidnapped, and they did all kinds of things that are unspeakable in church on Sunday morning. Some 1,400 or more people. They hide behind innocent humans. They hide under hospitals and so forth. And for some reason, the world is saying Israel has done something wrong. In fact, a really bizarre thing has happened. The perpetrators are called the victims, and the victims are called the perpetrators. How alone do you think the Jewish people feel in the world today of 2023? Last Tuesday, I participated in a Zoom call, a workshop entitled Navigating Israel's Meaning Crisis, and it was actually conducted by the International Logotherapy Institute of Israel, which means a lot of the people on the call were Israelis or Jewish people from around the world. We had breakout sessions, and I was in a breakout session with two people. One of, the breakout, one of the people was a doctor from the Democratic Republic of Congo. If you know anything about the Democratic Republic of Congo, there's another hot spot of violence and crime in our world today. So obviously it was a very important issue to him. The other person was a lady, a Jewish lady, who had moved her family from Mexico to Israel. She was Mexican, but Jewish. She moved her family to Israel. You know why? To escape the crime, the drug trade, and the corruption. And three years later, what are they experiencing? This terrorist attack. She, like many other Jewish people today, is, must be asking, where is God? What is the meaning of all of this? And what I'm leading up to is this. The expectation that Isaiah talks about and the expectation that we celebrate at Advent, it's not metaphorical. It's real. It's palpable. It's a felt need. It is a cry of people in distress crying out to their God. And if we simply read it as devotional people, we are not religious. Does that make sense? If we only see this as devotional literature to make our day a little easier, we are not religious. This is a prayer that says to God, you were there then, where are you now? Advent, therefore, while being a time of hope, is also a time of anxiety, a time of anxious hoping. So I invite you to think, if there was a time in your life in which you were so anxious, so worried, so concerned, so weighed down with sorrow or trouble, the only thing you could do was cry out to God. That's what the spirit of this text is all about. And with that thought, let's move on to the second half of verse 5 through verses 7. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Pretty heady. So this is the, the section that I refer to as repentance. But I have to put a little disclaimer in here first. Repentance is always appropriate when it is a healthy response to our own sense of doing wrong. I know I did wrong, therefore I should repent. But in contrast to this, I want to emphasize that victims who are innocent should not be blamed. Am I making sense? We should not say to someone who was innocent or an innocent victim, you're responsible for this. So when a person suffers due to the evil deeds of another person, they should not accept the blame. And, what, and since I have been relating 
this passage in Isaiah to current events, I want to be very, very clear. October 7th was an attack of pure terrorism, similar to that of 9-11, but actually much worse in many ways. The innocent men, women, and children that were killed, raped, and mistreated, kidnapped, and so forth, I am not seeing them as guilty. However, as I had mentioned, a bizarre thing has happened. The perpetrators, Hamas, are claiming to be the victims, and the people that they misused, they're calling the perpetrators. But to be clear, I am not applying the verses of Isaiah 5b through 7 to the victims here. However, in Isaiah's generation, there were many prophets, including Isaiah, but also Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and some of the lesser-known prophets who believed that the Babylonian destruction of the temple in the land of Judah was, in fact, either a punishment from God or at least something that God allowed to happen because of the wrongdoing of the people of Judah. Of course, the prophets were very unpopular in saying these things. Why? Because, you know, they were treated like, you're not patriotic. You don't love your country. What do you mean the Babylonians destroyed us because we're sinners? We're good people. No, that's not the answer. But that's what the prophets said, and even though they suffered for preaching this message, their message stuck, and it influenced Jewish history from that time on, and it shaped the prophetic perspective. And so this prophecy from Isaiah, this prayer, as I am treating it, carries with it a statement of the need for God's people to repent and to get their lives in order. So again, here we are reading these words of Isaiah during the season of Advent and meditating on the coming of Christ. Repentance is one way that we prepare for the coming of Christ. Every year the gospel reading in the lectionary uh, brings with it the preaching of John the Baptist. You remember that guy, hairy guy, kind of a little edgy person, doesn't possess all of the social graces, you know. But during the, the uh, season of, of Lent, sorry, Advent, we read his message where he does what? He says, repent, make way for the Lord. You see, during Advent, we're not supposed to prepare for Jesus by leaving out a plate of cookies and, cold and a glass of milk, right? That's Santa Claus. When Jesus comes, we are told to clean out our closets. We are told to get our lives in order, to examine ourselves and ask if we have caused God to turn away from us because of what? Our sin. You guys are very perceptive. Very, very perceptive. It is, in fact, because of human sinfulness that we believe God has to intervene in the first place, right? But also, if we want God to come to our aid, we need to clean up our act. We need to ask for it. We need to cry out to God. And I, right here, I'd like to read the words of John the Baptist in Mark, Mark 1, 7 through 9. This is one of our Advent readings. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Remember, that's not the best greeting to, to meet people with, right? You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, just so you don't get confused, the Hallmark Channel has decided not to make a Christmas movie about John the Baptist. Right? Because there's no, there's no happy ending. There's no... There's no, you know, re unrequited love that gets requited, you know, in there somewhere, I don't know. But all joking aside, the point is very simple. 
Asking God to come into our lives is a very serious affair. God's coming at Sinai was scary to the ancient Israelites. Why should it be any different for us? You ever think about that? Let's carry that thought into the final section of our text today. Verses 8 and 9. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Don't miss the communal nature of this passage. Throughout Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9, the prophet has been using the pronouns we, our, and us. Not I, me, and mine, right? We, our, and us. And that is our indication that this message is not individualized, per se. It's for the group. It's for the people. I still believe it's like a pastoral prayer where someone speaks to God on behalf of the congregation. The congregation in our text would be the people of Isaiah's generation. They called out in their distress. They reminded God of his great deeds of the past, and they expressed a desire to get things right, to repent. And now they present a request for God to remember them as in acting on their behalf. In biblical language, this is to remember the covenant. Remember does not mean simply to recall. Oh yeah, the covenant, that thing. No, 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 no. Remembering means to act. Just like listening doesn't mean hearing. We can hear things all day long, but to listen means that we are acting on it. Does that make sense? Okay, good enough. The transition from remembering sin to remembering as as acting is covenant. God has a covenant with his people. To invoke the covenant means to reaffirm that bond that has been estranged because of sin. At the time this text was presented by the prophet, the congregation of Isaiah's generation was in a state of anxiety. They were in distress, and they were anxiously looking for some relief from God. But unlike their ancestors who had come out of Egyptian slavery, uh, these people in Isaiah's generation, they knew something about God's power because they could read about it. You know, the, the slaves, they had to experience it firsthand. These people had to recall it from their history, but they also recalled what God did at Sinai God created a covenant with their people at Sinai. Remember your covenant. Where was that now? Why are we languishing in this misery, they might ask. Forget the sin, but remember the sinners, if I may paraphrase a saying. We are your people. Remember the covenant. So in closing, Let me ask these questions. What are the anxious yearnings, strivings for God's presence that burn in your spirit during this period of Advent, of expectation? There is, after all, a reason that we today read this text, is there not? What do we hope that God will do in the world today? What do we hope that God will change? Where do we want him to intervene? What are the acts of evil, suffering, neglect, etc., that we are weary of and we want God to, to attack, to address, to, to correct? What are the existential threats that make life today seem precarious? Or to put it another way, how badly do we need a Savior? Our closing hymn today is uh, a new one. It's called Christians All Your Christians All Your Lord is Coming. We'll sing the first and the second verses. I invite you to stand as we sing.
people of hope. Let hope live in your heart and share the hope of Christ with all you meet. Share hope by noticing someone else's humanity. Share hope by listening to someone's story. Share hope by praying for the world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share hope. As you go out into the wonder of God's creation, share hope with all whom you meet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.